Hi there, this is the Frontline Web Development class. My name is Jeffrey. Uh, we're going to start on our recap on, uh, well, uh, we're going to be talking about jQuery mostly during our recap because the class in earnest is on AngularJS and it's important to sort of understand like where people were before they started taking a look at libraries like Angular. Um, and also it'll help reacquaint us with the thing that we're going to be pretty much transforming into an Angular app throughout the class because we've already built a little uh, jQuery-based um, Twitter application, essentially. And if the noise bridge wiki will actually load, then I can show it to you. If it won't load, then uh, I can just basically take you guys to um, jeffreyhw slash fwd on GitHub. So um, you've probably seen this. You've probably downloaded this. If not, go to jeffreyhw slash fwd, github.com, and uh, go ahead and clone the repository. If you don't know how to clone, you, you weren't here for that class, just download the zip file. It's fine. It's really just uh, for you to be able to take a look at series 10 um, class. Oh, great. I forget. Class 8? Let me double check here. No. Class 7. Yeah, I think class 7 is when we last talked about this application, because we were dealing with dealing in Ajax and stuff like that. Um, that or, yeah, no, actually, yeah, this is fine. Yeah, class seven. Class seven is what I want you guys to download. So uh, yeah, go ahead and uh, download that, open it up, series 10, class seven, and we're going to take a look at that. <clears throat> so go ahead and open up index.html when you are uh, there. Uh, this version is the one that, that doesn't have Ajax in it, which is good because we're probably not going to do the whole Ajax part of the of transferring over it, transferring it over to Angular. Um, we 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 could if we had time, but we probably won't. Um, I used to teach two two weeks on Angular, uh, one on kind of the basics and more on like uh, I don't know some more advanced stuff. But I'm going to kind of pare it down this time and replace that time with talking about React instead, which we'll be talking about next week. <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, this is what we put together last time around. Uh, I was, I, I, I'm paying for my lazy mistake of not putting the buttons on all three tweets, and so it looks a little weird to pretend there are buttons on all of these. Um, and as usual, we can go ahead and use the uh, developer tools to take a look at the uh, parts of the page. So what I want you guys to go to, uh, as, as usual, when we're debugging JavaScript, I want you guys to go to the Sources panel here. Again, to open up this develop, develop tools thing, it's just right click anywhere on any page and click inspect, and this whole thing should pop up. I want to go over to sources uh, because we want to read through our app.js file and see what this whole thing's about. Uh, yeah, so uh, what's worth noting here is that this is more a traditional JavaScript, uh, more a traditional website in that all of everything that you see on the page initially has been. Uh, loaded via the initial HTML request. So all this stuff that we're seeing here, it's all pretty much available via view source. Um, the code that we've written in JavaScript is not responsible for generating all of this stuff. Um, it's, uh, but uh, we'll be seeing that that will, well, actually, I might take that back. Um, <laughs> it actually, with Angular, you can do it that way, or you don't have to. It depends on how far I get. Um, but yeah, uh, as you can see, this is all just kind of static stuff. And we're using jQuery to bring it to life versus using uh, some sort of JavaScript uh, you know, library to create the code in the first place, which is what some people do, uh, well, which is what some libraries do, and which we'll be talking about eventually in this class. Anyway, um, as usual with jQuery, you go ahead and use the dollar sign uh, function to find something on the page, passing in a string representing a selector. So uh, we're selecting the form on the page. We're selecting the text area on the page. Um, and when we do that sort of thing, we're able to add event listeners to these specific things. So the way that a jQuery-powered page usually works is that we are adding event listeners to certain stuff to make it respond to your interactions. So for example, if you submit a form, run this function. Um, if you uh, key up on a text area, that is lift your, lift your finger from the keyboard, then uh, go ahead and run this function. If you click anything uh, with the class of tweets, then run this fun function. And same thing here, if you click something with the class of tweets, run this function. So you know uh, that's what event listeners are all about. Um, we'll we'll uh, see that that event listeners are assigned differently when we start talking about Angular. <clears throat> um, but you know there are some things that that certainly match up. For example, um, regardless of what kind of library you're using, you're probably going to want to prevent the default. 
from occurring. Um, the default behavior is whatever will happen on an HTML page when you click something. I say HTML page because I mean this is like what will happen with, with zero CSS, zero JavaScript, just what these things are meant to do. For example, clicking a link brings you to another page. Submitting a form submits that form and brings you to the next page. Um, so when you prevent default, you are preventing that sort of stuff from happening. You can even prevent default on like typing in the field if you wanted to. If you wanted to uh, prevent default on the key down uh, event, you could prevent someone from typing into it. Or you could just set the, uh, the attribute to disabled, which will do it in HTML. Um, attribute disabled to disabled or true or whatever. But anyway, what we're trying to do is prevent the form from submitting because uh, we're trying to treat this as a single page application or SPA. Uh, single page application basically means that uh, everything that you do on this page, um, everything that you need to do in this application is done on this page without you have ever having to refresh it or navigate to a different page or anything like that. <coughs> so. You know, making sure that you don't leave the page, and that in most cases is uh, one of the kind of you know uh, one of the features uh, or common you know common uh, features, yeah, whatever of um, of a single page application. But um, what we're going to find uh, at the end of this class is that this code, the, re the additional code that I've written here, is quite silly. Because what I'm doing right now is, in, in, in order to in order to add a new tweet on the page, which is what this thing does. See, I just added a new tweet on the page. Uh, it goes ahead and finds some code that's already on the page, some uh, some uh, that is to say an element on the page, and it duplicates it, it clones it, changes all the stuff inside it, and puts it back on the page. That's a little silly because it makes the assumption, for one thing, that there actually is one of these elements on the page. Um, it makes the assumption, well, or it doesn't necessarily make the assumption, but it, try, it has to remove all of the state from this element before it can put it on the page again. For example, if you retweet this, but now this tweet has the state of retweeted, or specifically the class of retweeted. Um, so we have to make sure to remove the class of retweeted or liked from anything that we're going to be duplicating. Um, which is kind of silly. We really shouldn't have to do that when we put something new on the page. That should really just be kind of like the template, if you will, for, for tweets. Um, yeah. Let me see here. <clears throat> what else? Um, we're, cha we're changing around some content. We're, changing, we're finding the tweet time, uh, which, is, which, has, which is this element, which is the class of tweet time, changing it to now. We're finding tweet content and changing it to the new tweet text value, which is the current value of the text area. You know, that's stuff you'll probably have to do regardless of what plane you're using. You have to replace some values based on other stuff. And finally, when we're all done, we change the value of the text area back to nothing. And then uh, at the end, we prepend the new tweet that we created, that we cloned, onto the page. So uh, there's that. Let me see here. Um, any questions so far about recapping stuff, how that works, why it works, whatever else? Okay. So uh, next up, we talk about calculating remaining characters. As you can see, when I uh, enter stuff into this form, uh, oh, you know, I just, I just realized something. I missed something. Um, you notice how when I, when I uh, enter something in and I press tweet that the number stays the same? That's a, that's a bug. And that bug could easily be fixed if I simply put calculate remaining characters right here, you know. Because that would also kind of reset the form. That is yet another one of those things you actually don't have to worry about when we talk about other sorts of libraries. We don't really have to worry about the state of the DOM. Uh, we just have to basically um, bind the, this little number to whatever the value is in that thing, and then the library will take care of the rest. So that's one of the things to look forward to with a better, or, or a, more, a more catered toward this sort of interaction library, like Angular or React or whatever. <clears throat> but yeah, if, uh, if we put this here, then, um, you know, does this, does this like do a runtime replacement? Yeah, it does, that's really cool. You can actually, in this, in this sources thing, you can edit the JavaScript and save it, and it turning this really weird shade of pinkish, reddish, whatever, means that it's now running off this version of it. It's kind of hot swapped the script. It's already uh, been loaded into the page with this new version. So as you can see, uh, it works. Ta-da, calculate remaining characters. So as you can see, calculate remaining characters takes the text area value, uh, replaces, re, uh, re, subtracts its length from the character limit, which is 140 up here, um, and then it changes the text of the counter, which is this thing here, and it makes sure that the tweet button will be disabled or not disabled based on the amount of remaining characters. 
Specifically, this is a really, really big Boolean strain or Boolean uh, expression that says, uh, is, re is remaining characters less than zero? Or, that's what these two pipes mean, is remaining characters equal to character limit? That is to say, if remaining characters is 140, or if remaining characters is less than zero, uh, then you should disable it. Because less than zero means you went over the limit. 140 means you didn't type anything. So in both cases, we don't want you to submit it. Um, yeah, so that's what happens every single time you key up on the text area. It also happens when the page loads. And it also happens when now when you submit a tweet. So as you can see, it's nice to have these sorts of functions that we can use all over the place, you know, so create functions. Um, yeah, and then finally, uh, at the end of the last jQuery class that we talked about, we, we were talking about um, delegating events, uh, delegating event listeners to, to, to or sorry, yeah, to child, child elements. What I mean by that specifically is, um, as you can see, when I press retweet and like on this thing, uh, it, it works. But interestingly enough, this element did not appear on the page when, uh, when we loaded the page. I, I'm sorry, it didn't exist on the page when we loaded the page. So uh, instead of listen, looking for every single one of these buttons that exists when the page loads and adding event listeners to that, think about it. If we did that, then if a new button was added to the page, uh, we wouldn't actually have an event listener on that. Even if it was cloned from a previous button that already exists, those, those JavaScript tie-ins, those don't, those don't carry over as well. So <clears throat> this, this retweet button would be inactive, but instead of adding a listener to the actual retweet button or the actual like button, we're adding a click listener to another thing called tweets, which in this case is this entire section. See how I'm highlighting the whole thing? This whole section, tweets, will always exist, regardless of how many uh, tweets live inside it. So you can definitely say that that can be clicked, and that can certainly be selected when the page is loaded, because even if there is zero, it will, it will live there. So what this is basically saying here is on click, comma, re, dot retweet. It's basically saying, hey, tweets, if you get clicked, but the actual click happens to land on something called retweet inside you, then run this function. So, you know, in other words, we're not talking to the retweet thing specifically. We're talking to its parent, which will definitely exist when the page loads. So that's that sort of event delegation thing, which helps out significantly. And uh, what we're doing is uh, saying this. Um, I also talked about the context variable this, which exists within the scope of every function as something different. Uh, in, in the case here, jQuery has uh, called this function such that this always corresponds to the specific button that was just clicked. So, because we know that, we can say things like this dot closest tweet. Closest means closest parent. So you just keep going up the chain for this button here, up and up until we find tweet. And so that's the closest tweet. And we toggle class retweeted, meaning we add retweeted or remove it based on whether it was there or not. Um, we're not specifically adding the class to this button. That's um, something that will make even more sense by the end of this class. We're adding the, the tweet to, we're adding the, the class retweeted to the tweet itself, even though it's only really just the button that, that's changing color. As you can see in our CSS, we're saying retweeted space dot retweet, meaning a, a, a retweet button inside something else that is retweeted becomes green. Why not just add, a, add the class to this button? Because I like, to, uh, I like to keep all of my state for this tweet in one place. Uh, it, it makes me easily be able to tell just find all the tweets on the page which have a certain status. It also makes it a little bit uh, more lenient for me to be able to style this different ways. If I want to have like a little, instead of this retweet button um, being green or whatever, I could put like a little badge in the corner, like a little green badge saying retweeted. Or, uh, you know, I can make, I can hide or, uh, hide or show other things. So, you know, the, the, the higher up the class goes, the better. A lot of pages will actually have, sometimes have uh, classes in the HTML tag, or sometimes the body tag, which um, are there for status purposes, but they, they allow like the entire page underneath it to be styled however, however you like. Um, this is going off on a tangent, but there's a library called Modernizer. Um, Modernizer is a feature detection library for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What that means is that it runs a whole bunch of tests every time the page loads, and then uh, it adds a bunch of classes to, oh, it doesn't, <laughs> well, huh, interesting. Well, let's go to another page that uses it, lab0.com, that's my company's site. 
as you can see here, this HTML element has a whole bunch of class stuff. And no touch, hash change, history, RGBA, background size. These are a whole bunch of tests that labzero.com runs. And based on uh, whether those classes are in the HTML element or not, you can style things underneath it however you want based on what's supported. So uh, you all, the same, same with JavaScript. You can basically say, like, if the HTML tag has a class of so-and-so, then run some additional stuff. So it's really cool. It just, it, it's just a little thing that adds these things for you. And based on the classes in the page, uh, or more programmatic stuff, you can say modernizer dot so-and-so to find out whether something is true or false. Um, you can make the page act differently just based on all that stuff. So that is the reason why I like putting classes as high as possible. Um, yeah. So that is pretty much my run through of the jQuery code we've written so far. Um, I uh, forgot to open up my little YouTube uh, comment thing, so I'm, I'm going to see if anyone's been uh, saying some stuff. One second. Um, also, events. Oh, good, live now. Uh, do do do. Let's open up the live chat. Any live chat? Nope, no live chat. Good. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I've got another 14 minutes to talk about pretty much anything, so if anyone uh, has any questions about this or wants to know anything that they think might be helpful to them in anticipation for learning a little bit about Angular or anything else, you know, just, talk, just tell me. Um, I, I guess I could point out now, well, no, I'll talk about it when the class starts, about Angular 1 and Angular 2. Um, they're different, uh, and I'll be talking about Angular 1 specifically. So. Yeah, there's that. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, um, yeah, I'm going to be hanging out and uh, come back at, at 8 o'clock for new stuff. Certainly get a lot of spam every time, spam on Twitter every time that I announce my class. A lot of businesses looking for words like Angular, thinking that it's very relevant, and then they follow me. I might, might have run out of block, you know. Having trouble reaching noise bridge. Is there any class materials you need to download today? Um, yes, the class materials you need to download today are right here. Um, you probably already have this because you probably have the Git repository locally. Um, it's series 10, class 7. I don't know why noisebridge.net won't load. Um, looks like the HTML finally loaded, but the CSS did not. So. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It seems very slow.
uh, starting new step at eight. Okay. Yes. As usual. I'm also doing a recap. I, I already went through a recap of the previous stuff. So if you have any questions about anything, you know, anything you feel like you might need to know before we start, then I'm here to answer your questions. Okay.
get started on new stuff. All right. Hi. This is the front end web development class. My name is Jeffrey. Uh, we're going to talk about AngularJS today. So uh, AngularJS is not at Angular Angular.io. It's AngularJS.org. Um, let's talk about that. Um, there's Angular 1 and Angular 2. They have slightly different names. This is called AngularJS 1, and it's called Angular 2. But um, the big difference is that there's one and there's two. So why, why am I teaching one and not two? Well, the deal is that they are quite different from one another. They're very, very different. Um, they, are, they have significantly different approaches, different uh, ways that you have to set it up to use it, um, just a very different approach. And what's more, Angular 2 just came out. I haven't used it. I haven't gotten the opportunity to use it. I don't really feel like I want to use it. So um, I'm teaching Angular JS 1 because uh, it is in wide use. A lot of people are using it. It's still being developed um, one way or another. Uh, and um, you know, people are kind of not moving from one to two as much as they are moving from one to other libraries, such as React, which I'll be talking about next week. Um, but I think one is still useful to understand. Uh, it, it gives you, um, well, it gives you a, a nice, uh, now that you know like how a, sort of a jQuery thing works, it gives you a, a good example of how uh, something called an MVC library works, model view controller, or model view in this case. Well, there are controllers too, uh, library. Um, the, the general idea behind Angular and other MV whatever libraries is uh, that they, they separate out the model and the view. Now, the model and the view are concepts. They refer to, um, the, the, the model refers to the data in your application. That is to say, uh, what sort of data is on, on the page, not necessarily how it's laid out in HTML. That's what the view is. The view is, what, what HTML should we be spitting out to represent our data? <clears throat> so by data, you know, if we go, if we, if I didn't close it, um, if we go to our, our noise Twitter page, the data on this page would be these three tweets. There are three tweets on this page. They are by Jeffrey. Um, the first one says, you give a bad name. The second one says, blah, blah, blah. That is data. This is me just representing it, speaking it, uh, because there is no, you know, there is no visual representation of the model that, other than the view. That that is the view does. So uh, the separation between model and view makes it so you can always know what the view is going to look like based on what the based on what is in the model. Uh, in the case of jQuery, you need to continue to massage the DOM. Change the, change the view around itself to be able to make sure that anything additional that you add to it um, is, is, uh, you know, is, is correctly moved over. It's kind of like, um, you know, you've got a, you've got a canvas you got like the, on which you've painted a whole bunch of oil strokes and whatever, but, and to make any changes, you have to sort of paint on top of it. That's kind of the old guard with jQuery and whatever. This new thing, essentially, you paint something based on your information, you get new information, you throw, the old, you throw that canvas away, and you paint an entire, entire new one. That sounds like it, it might be uh, overkill or whatever, but these libraries have a very good way of only updating what needs to be updated. Um, and uh, so they're pretty efficient at what they do. And uh, yeah, so in other words, you don't have to worry about what your view ends up. You don't have to worry about maintaining your view so much as you just have to worry about what you want the view to look like. Um, what did you know? And then you change your data around. So that separation makes things uh, pretty nice, pretty efficient, um, easier to work with in many cases. Especially a case like this, where in my recap I talked about some downsides of this whole sort of like you know 
your your view is also is also your data sort of thing. So let's separate them. Um, Angular JS, much like uh, jQuery or whatever else, is a JavaScript library. So if we want to download it, uh, then um, well, there are some options. Let's use the stable version. Minified is fine. Uh, just like just like jQuery, Angular is a big file that has a whole bunch of JavaScript that you usually probably should not care about. There's a lot of very like ridiculous optimized stuff that's going on there. So minified is fine. We don't really need to look into it. Um, and then these are different ways to to get it. Uh, you can just download it. You can press the download button, which will give you a zip, which will give you the JavaScript file, which is probably what we want. Or you can reference it from a content delivery network that is someplace online that has the file available for you. Or you can use Bower or NPM, two different uh, package managers that allow you to simply just install something by name. Um, I'm just going to keep things basic because this is really just a basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript thing, and I'm going to just download the JavaScript file. So press the download button, and there you go. Um, go ahead and take Series 10 Class 7 and make a copy of it uh, in your own workspace. Don't make a copy of it here. Don't duplicate it here. That's for me to do. Um, I don't want you to do it uh, in the download of my front end web development thing because the, the next time you pull my stuff, it'll override all the work that you did. So make sure that, as usual, you make a copy of this folder and put it into your own workspace, some other folder on your computer. That said, I'm creating a copy. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. OK, great. Um, all right, so got my uh, new folder uh, with all the stuff from, from uh, class 7. And I'm going to start making some changes to it. Uh, I'm going to be loading up Angular, and we're going to see what an Angular application, a very basic one, looks like. Um, the good thing about this is that we can actually do it a little piecemeal. We can do it piece by piece. Angular uh, works alongside jQuery. In fact, uh, if jQuery has been loaded, Angular can make use of jQuery to maybe, I'm, I'm not sure if the term is speed up, but make uh, more efficient some, some ways that it accesses the code. It will essentially, it, uh, Angular ships with its own kind of mini version of jQuery, but if jQuery is already there, then it will go ahead and use that. So they work hand in hand in some ways. Remember that you know, Angular is still responsible for changing around your view. And that's what JavaScript, that's what jQuery pretty much just does. It just changes your view. So it, it, it makes use of that. So, um, or it doesn't have to. So again, it's, it's, an, op it's an optional sort of, it's optional dependency. OK, cool. So all that said, let's go ahead and take uh, angular.min.js and just drag it right in here. And uh, we're going to open up our index.html file and our text editor. Hello, where is it? Didn't open. Let's try that again. There we go. And we're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom here and include our new Angular file here. Script source angular.min.js. There you go. Cool. So, um, yeah, let me just make sure you do that. So the only amount of bootstrapping that we have to do uh, in our in our JavaScript file to sort of like tell this page, hey, there's going to be an Angular app. Um, we're going to give it a name. We're going to say that it's a certain thing, and then we're going to tie it into the page in a certain way. So this is the first step: is just making the making Angular aware of the fact that we want to turn this page into an Angular application. So what does that look like? We're going to open up app.js. Just go ahead and do this. And down here at the very bottom, I'm going to leave all this jQuery stuff here at a time. Essentially, throughout this class, I'm going to, bit by bit, just remove our jQuery stuff once it becomes uh, useless, you know, once, once we write the code to sort of replace it. Third, first thing we do, though, is we say angular.module, and I'm going to say noise Twitter, and then I pass in an empty array for now. Okay, so Angular, of course, is uh, has been loaded up by the fact that we loaded up angular.min.js. When we say angular.module noise Twitter, and then we pass it in an empty array, what we're saying is we're creating a new module called noise Twitter. Um, and this array denotes any sort of dependencies, uh, any sort of Angular-specific dependencies for this module that we're creating. A module is just another fancy name for, well, it's, it's kind of a block of code or a collection of code 
Um, and in this case, we're going to be using this module uh, to control the DOM of our page, control all the HTML. Um, right now, we don't have any dependencies on other Angular modules that might have been created otherwise. Um, but you know, much like how there are jQuery plugins or uh, NPM modules or Bower modules, if you remember that class, uh, same thing happens with Angular. You can go ahead and load up other uh, Angular-powered JavaScript files, if you will, and list them out here and make use of them one way or another. So that's nice. Um, OK, but, uh, so that's one step. But uh, the next step is interesting. In jQuery, we uh, write JavaScript code that grabs onto the DOM and, and, and uh, makes changes to it from the JavaScript code. But interestingly enough, even though Angular is this you know, library that's all about writing you know, more, just better JavaScript to do certain stuff, we actually are going to go into our HTML file and add in a few special properties to certain elements to uh, tie things together. It's kind of interesting. Let's start off at the, very, the body, all the way up here. And the body is going to get a new um, attribute called ng-app, and we're going to say noise Twitter. NG, by the way, stands for Angular. So that's just NG whenever you see that. Think Angular. So what happens here is that Angular is going to take a look at the DOM. It's going to take a look at all over, all over HTML and say, oh, I've just found the NG app property. And it's pointing to noise Twitter. Oh, I seem to have a module called noise Twitter. Um, I'm going to allow this module to essentially take control of all of the HTML underneath this body here. So that's how we essentially tell Angular that the DOM and our JavaScript are intertwined, essentially. Cool. Um, now, uh, the next thing that we want to do is start changing around this DOM so it doesn't have all the data inside it. So change around this HTML so it doesn't have all the data inside it when it loads. We want to populate this data uh, from, uh, well, from our JavaScript. Or we, which we just basically want to separate the data from being sort of like dispersed out. I've got my, you know, my username here. I've got the time here. I've got the posts here. We want to get rid of all that. What we want to do essentially is uh, turn this into more of a skeleton or a template um, that allows us to, based on what the data is, just populate all those individual values with what's somewhere else. And by the way, I, I keep talking about the data, the data, the model. When it really comes down to it, the model in, jo in, in most JavaScript libraries is just an object, like an object, you know, like key value pair object with maybe some arrays inside it and some strings inside that or numbers or whatever else. It's just data. That's all it is. Um, and we just store it in a certain way that Angular knows to access it and then apply it to this page. Um, that having been said, uh, let's actually, yeah, before we go any further, let's go ahead and create the create that, that um, space within Angular to store our data, store the model portion of our stuff. Uh, what, we do, what we do to store data is create something called a controller. That controller will, uh, the controller is one of a few different ways in Angular, one, that you can essentially uh, set up some data to be stored somewhere and then be able to apply it to the page because um, the page will simply have access to it within uh, this special, um, area within JavaScript memory called the scope. Um, you can think of scope as just like a function scope or whatever. You're able to add variables to it, add properties, add methods, add whatever else. And whatever things you add to the scope, you will also have access to all throughout um, anything that is being controlled by both the ng app and the ng controller, which is one part of this module. So let's go ahead and create a, mo create a controller. Angular dot control. Oh, sorry. Um, it's not Angular dot controller. From here on, uh, we're going to be accessing Angular dot module. Um, so we might as well keep a reference to it. So I'm going to say var app equals Angular dot module. Cool. And now we can say app dot controller. I'm just going to call it main controller. And uh, to set up main controller, we're going to give it a function. This function is going to run whenever Angular notes that a certain part of the page is under the control of this main controller. And uh, 
what I'm going to do is, uh, well, let me think about this. Yeah, I might as well talk about this. Um, so I talked about dependencies. I talked about how this uh, module, in order to load in the first place, lists out a number of dependencies which need to be loaded up first. Well, the same thing can go for other, other parts of this module, such as its controller. Before this function can run, I might need it to ask Angular for a, a, certain, a certain number of things. So um, what I'm actually going to do is put this function inside an array. And this fun and so you know, just we're surrounded in square brackets. And as you know, an array can contain multiple values. This function is going to be the last value of this array. But all values that precede it are simply going to be a list of strings referring to other parts uh, from within Angular or other modules that might be necessary, other sorts of things that I want to simply load up and inject into this function uh, so I can run it the proper way. One thing that I'm going to need is access to something called dollar sign scope. Dollar sign, by the way, has nothing to do with JavaScript. Uh, sorry, nothing to do with jQuery. Um, even though jQuery has that dollar sign function that allows you to say, find this, find that. Um, uh, Angular uses the dollar sign at the beginning of certain names to, uh, to basically denote that this is an internal value from Angular that you can have access to. Um, so whenever you see something like that, this is something that is sort of built into the way Angular works that allows you to sort of ask it for certain things. So now that we're asking for something called dollar sign scope, this function will be run with scope being injected into it as the first argument. So now we can access scope. Let me slow down and make sure that people are on, on board so far with what I'm talking about. Any confusion? I mean, obviously, maybe, maybe things will be sort of like cleared up once I actually add something into the scope and then apply it to the page. But so far, are there any questions that people can put into words? <laughs> any sorts of you know, confusions that, that uh, might actually be rem remediable? Remediable? That I can remedy. No? Everything good so far? Any questions online? Let me double check. No questions online yet. OK, cool. So let's go back. OK, so what I like to do with this scope, I can do anything I want to this scope. This scope is an object onto which I can add anything. So what I'm going to add is something called tweets. And tweets is going to be an array. And this array is going to be an array of objects. Each object is going to represent uh, a different tweet on the page. This is, by the way, something that, that I've decided to do. I can represent my data however I want. Um, this is not something that Angular needs me to do, like for, supply it with an array of objects or something. This is just the best way for me to lay out the data that is currently on this page. So it's an array, because as you can see on the page, there's a, there's a you know, list of stuff. And then each one of these has different points of data, like my avatar, the nickname, um, or so the username, the, and then the content and the time that it was posted. So those seem to be four things that I might want to hold on to. Oh, also, whether it's been retweeted and whether it's been liked. But I'm going to hold off on that just for a second. OK, so let's start with tweet number one and say that the content is, eh, sorry, you give love a bad name. I'm going to say the author is Jeffrey W. That the, uh, Avatar is, I think, avatar.jpg. At the time it was posted, is it just going to be now, which is going to be silly. I mean, in the real world, this would be something like a date. Um, and then you would use some sort of special function to turn it into the word now or something else um, before you actually put it into your view. But for now, I'm just going to store it as now. Yeah, so I think that's it. And I'm just going to do that. Two more times. I can just go ahead and uh, put a little comma here at the end of this object and just copy and paste this two more times. And uh, what are the other tweets? Old McDonald had a farm. And I'm a little T about Jordan stuff. Whoa. Oh, and actually, this is one hour, two hours. Three hours, and let's fix our syntax error here by back uh, by um, escaping this um, 
apostrophe with the backslash. So we go, there we go. That is all the data on the page. Three people are still typing, so I'm just gonna give it a second to sink in. Okay, cool. So now that I've got all the data on the page, I don't really have to care about what's inside this uh, this this file here. I can get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. For example, I don't need three articles on the page. Each article represents a different tweet. But because my data, because the, the, the count of tweets is going to be represented by how long this array is, uh, I don't need to print out my article three times in here. I only need to print it out once, and I want to turn it into more sort of a template of how the, uh, of how the data should be represented. So first step, actually, well, before any of this, the first step is not only to say load up ng app when, when you hit the body, but also specify that everything underneath here is going to be under the jurisdiction of the ng controller main controller. Remember that I, I wrote these we use words noise Twitter and main controller in my app.js. So from here on, um, anything that I reference uh, using these ng things inside the body will be will be referring to the scope uh, of main control. So Next, now that I've done that, I've added ng controller main control here. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of two of these articles because they're unnecessary. And this first article, I'm going to start adding a whole bunch of other ng stuff that tells it to uh, that tells it to do certain things, tells it to act a certain way. Um, basically, by adding ng throughout your page, you are making your DOM behave a certain way. So the thing that I want this article to behave like is to repeat. I want this article tag to repeat for, um, I think that it's going to be for tweet in tweets. I think that'll work. Yeah. It's actually been a little while since I've last written some Angular stuff, so I might. The, the, some, spec, some specifics. I think that I'm right about this. <laughs> so let's talk about, about what this means. Tweet, ng repeat, tweet in tweets. So, uh, like I said, because I wrote this main con ng controller main control up here, I have access to something called tweets throughout this entire form, uh, or throughout this entire body. It has nothing to do, by the way, with this class tweets here. Classes. And then anything that has ng dash whatever, those are just two different worlds. This class is just meant for CSS styling at this point. Um, I don't I don't intend to use classes to you know look for them and make any changes to them within my Angular world. Uh, from here on, whenever I add classes, they're only going to be for just like uh, presentational CSS purposes. Uh, because if I really want to change something around then um, all I really have to do is start adding these ng things, and it'll work the way that I want it to. And of course, I'll be going through a whole bunch of other ng dash stuff as I come along, as I go along. But what's happening inside ng repeat? Tweet in tweets. So again, tweets is referring to this array. Tweet, what's that? Well, I am creating a new variable called tweet that I have access to, and it's going to change um, for as many times as there are tweets. So this article is going to be printed out how many times do you think? Three times, right, because there are three tweets. But every time that it's printed out, I'm going to have access to the special uh, tweet uh, variable that I can use ng whatever or anywhere else uh, to print out some certain values of it. So uh, let me think about this. Yeah. So let's take a look at some stuff. First of all, ahref, twitter.com slash jefferyhw. Well, I want to basically use the author of this tweet instead of that. So uh, I could do some sort of ng 
ng something and like ng bind will allow me to bind the value of something to the value to two things. But there's also actually a second way, um, other than using ng all over the place, and it's using a special uh, syntax called uh, handlebar syntax. Angular allows me to write out um, think this little thing called handlebars, and it looks like this. Mm, yeah, I think that's it. Tweak that author. Yeah. So check it out. I'm using double brackets inside this string, and uh, the cool thing about that is that it's going to basically just look for any double brackets throughout this entire chunk of HTML, and wherever it finds it, it's going to well, in this case, it's going to take the tweet that it's iterating through currently and uh, just replace this whole thing with the value of tweet.author. We can do the same thing here. Tweet.author. We can also do uh, right here, same thing. Tweet.author. Oh, and this person too. There we go. These double brackets are available within these uh, within these attributes, within these, you know, double quote attributes inside the HTML element, but also as the text inside there. So regardless of whether they're, you know, inside one of these things or actually within the actual text within an element, you can use it both ways. Uh, okay, so I think that we've gotten rid of Jeffrey AGW throughout here, but let's next go on to the avatar. It looks like instead of avatar.jpg, we're going to do tweet.avatar. And let's see, instead of 1h, we're going to do tweet.time. And finally, instead of this, we're going to say tweet.content. Cool. So there you go. All right, any questions at this point? Let's take a look and see if it all works. It might not. I might have forgotten something. <laughs> Looks like it worked. I did get an error. Tweet.avatar. Oh, that's not found. That's funny. Huh. That doesn't seem to have worked the way I, I wanted it to. What did I do wrong? Hmm. Yeah, no, I think the. Uh... The browser trying to load avatar, tweet the avatar, but it doesn't exist yet because Angular did change that thing. Oh, and then it, and then it, yeah, that actually brings up a good point. What's actually happening here is that, um, well, let's talk, of course, about the order of operations here. Before these JavaScript files down at the bottom can load, the HTML loads, the rest of the HTML loads. It goes HTML, HTML, HTML. Oh, time to download some CSS. OK, and then I'm going to keep going HTML, HTML, HTML. Now, the deal is that this image file, even though it's got a really weird source thing, a really weird art alt thing, is going to be loaded up onto the page prior to Angular.js even downloading, um, and definitely, definitely prior to our app.js loading. So, uh, if we don't want that to happen, then we've got a pretty simple uh, solution, which is just to take this stuff and put it up here instead. Now, uh, I have I have warned against this in previous classes. I basically said, oh, wait, hold on a second. Um, if you put your script tags in the head, then it's going to, uh, it's going to make it so the HTML on your page uh, doesn't load up until all the JavaScript is on the page. But doesn't that seem to be like what we want in this case? We actually don't want our HTML to appear until the JavaScript actually has loaded, because if it did, then, then we'd get that weird flash of stuff. We'd get the browser trying to load the wrong kind of image. Uh, we'd actually start to see like very, you know, for, for slower connections, it would actually be kind of worse. You might see like those handlebar things all over the page before AngularJS actually takes care of things. So by loading this first, we can be sure that that is not going to happen. OK, well, I made a mistake. <laughs> 
Uh, let me see here. That also, mm, okay. I'm probably going to undo one thing, which is move app back down here. Nope, oh, that's still, hmm. Let me think about this. Uh, so there's a special attribute you can use called NGS, SRC. So oh, NG source? Yes. Could do that. I could do that, um, but I also could do something else. One second. So let's just talk about these errors. This first error is happening for the same reason, that it's trying to load up the wrong sort of image file. This, uh, on, on line 25 of app.js, is, is a problem because it's currently trying to get the text area's value and get its length. The only problem is that because app.js is now loading before any of the, the HTML on the page loads, there is no text area, so you can't get a length of nothing. So that's why I have that error there. And I'm not sure if that's actually cascading and causing everything else to go wrong. Um, but what I'm going to do, just for now, is get rid of, well, I'm actually just going to comment out this line here. Because calculate remaining characters is the only stuff on the page that expects certain stuff to be on the page, or needs certain stuff to be on the page for it to run. All these other things, looking for tweets, looking for, uh, looking for submit, looking for key, uh, text area on key up, um, that stuff isn't going to work anymore because it's going to run before the rest of the page loads, but we don't care because we're changing it all to Angular. But right now, we don't want to calculate remaining characters immediately when the page loads. We'll be moving that over to Angular shortly. So that having been done, OK, that does it, but it still loads tweet.avatar. So you might be right about doing ng source instead. Is it just like this? ng source on the image. No, that's not it. Oh, on the image. Oh, got it. Yes. All right. Yeah, oh, you're totally right. OK. So um, right, no, no, you're totally right. I remember this now. Sorry. Again, this has been a while. Um, ng repeat, remember, when you do any ng whatever, blah, 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 then it's great. If you have an image that doesn't actually have a source tag, then the browser isn't going to try to load it. Rather, uh, Angular knows about this, and so it's going to find anything with an ng source and change it over to source so the browser does load it properly. But prior to that, it's not going to do it. So great. Now we've got, well, we still have a little bit of, um, see, a little bit of weird flickering going on here, which um, I'm sure there's a way that I could defer that one way or another, but uh, I'm just not going to deal with it right now. I kind of forget how, I've, how I usually solve it. Well, one way that I will actually solve it is uh, later on is that instead of putting anything in the body whatsoever, many single page apps are, are usually have almost an entirely blank body. The only thing that they actually have in there is a bunch of script tags, which insert stuff into the body. One thing that we'll be able to do using Angular is take this thing like the like this article here, and maybe the form and other sort of stuff, and turn it all into a template that lives inside a script tag. And uh, all, that's a little weird because up to this point, we've been using script tags to put JavaScript inside. Like these, all these script things just load up JavaScript files, but. With uh, Angular, you can put some HTML inside a script tag and specify that this is a template for Angular to use somewhere down the line. So, so Angular has this built-in functionality. Since I'm talking about it, I might as well do it. Uh, Angular has some built-in functionality to, uh, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it. I'll do it later if I have the time, because I, I, I'm, it, I'll get a little bit too much off track. But it does have the ability to take some stuff from somewhere else and then in inject it or include it wherever you want it to, do, to be. Um, but we'll skip that for a little bit. Anyway, um, as you can see, the page is as usual. Um, the buttons have stopped working. The form has stopped working. Uh, tweeting doesn't really do anything anymore, so that's too bad. But um, as you can see, the, the stuff actually does get printed out. And it's all thanks to the combination of ng-repeat, which is looping through our list of tweets, and then all these little uh, handlebars interpolations throughout here that are printing out different parts of that tweet object that we're iterating through. Cool. Any questions at this point? Thoughts about how things work, why they're working, what have you? Anyone hopelessly lost? If you're hopelessly lost, I can help. Uh, I will say that, um, you know, Although this comes naturally to me now, when I started learning Angular, there was it seems to me like it was a very 
high uh, um, uh, learning curve um, that it took me it took me a long time to sort of rip, you know wrap my head around certain concepts. Um, there is there is a very li long list of ng this ng that, and the documentation isn't the most straightforward stuff in the world. Um, like, let me close this if I can and take a look at the uh, the uh, API reference. The Angular API is all listed out here, and it's not as straightforward as you'd expect it to be. Um, a lot of these ng so and so ng form ng height ng href ng most of these can be used as uh, as attributes like ng dash whatever, but they can also be used in different ways. There's a whole bunch of strange stuff going on there. Um, there's there, there's the concept of how some of these things like as you see, these are all camel case, lowercase ng, uppercase disa d disabled. Um, uh, certain things that have na camel case names can also be referenced in HTML using dash case. That sort of translation is, is often automatic and sometimes confuses people. Uh, so that's another sort of little weird quirk to Angular. But uh, and then that's that's one thing that might trip you up if you're if you're looking for stuff um, throughout the documentation. But you know, just like we were saying, you can take a look at say ng source. Angular markup like hash in a source attribute doesn't work right. The browser will fetch the URL from the literal text, literal text until Angular replaces the expression. Ng source directly solves that problem. So you know, once you actually do find the right page you're looking for, then it's a straight then, then it's a straightforward thing. So ng source instead of source. There you go. Cool. Okay, where are we next? Um, let's see here. So we've now, uh, we're now able to um, list out the tweets. I think the next thing we want to do is be able to add a new tweet, right? Cool. So, um, right. Let's talk about event listeners. Um, of course, again, in Angular, uh, sorry, in jQuery, what you do is you find something by a class or by some other selector, and you say, on this, on submit, so and so. Uh, but in the case of uh, in the case of Angular, there is a different um, attribute or directive, if you will, for oops, sorry, I made the page wrong. There's a different directive for every kind of event you could be listening for, such as ng submit enables binding Angular expressions to on submit events. So uh, when you add an uh, an ng submit attribute to a form, then uh, you can go ahead and run some code upon submission. So, let's do that. So I just added ng submit add tweet right here. So let's talk about this code. What's happening here is that inside these quotation marks, I've just essentially created my own little function. Now, my function that I created is not called add tweet. This is actually a function that is calling another thing that I haven't yet created called add tweet. But whenever I use ng submit or ng click or ng any sort of other event listener, essentially anything that I write inside here, I can even do multiple things. You know. It's just a whole, it's just a series of different expressions. And it's just kind of like I just created my own little anonymous function that's right here. So, um, you know, the first thing it does is add tweet. The second thing it does is console.log you did it. Um, so if I do this now, it's probably going to, uh, is it going to do it? Oh, it's not. I must have done, well, probably what happened is it tried to run add tweet and it failed, and it failed silently. So before I can actually see a little console.log you did it, I need to create something called add tweet. So, but where does add tweet live? How can I access a function called add tweet? Um, you know, do I just say var var add tweet equals so and so? Nope, because uh, the because when because all this all this ng stuff here happening within the body operates within a certain scope. So I just can't access the global window scope and expect it to work. So instead of doing var add tweet, I simply just do scope dot add tweet is a function. And this function can do whatever I want it to do. So 
I need to add something to my list of tweets. I specifically want to put a new tweet at the very beginning of my list so it shows up at the top. Um, so I could do this. I can say scope.tweets.unshift, which means put at the beginning a new, a new item. And then I'm just going to pass in an object. So the object is going to be author Jeffrey W. Avatar is avatar.jpg. Time is now. But what about the content? How do we get the content? Where should the content come from? OK, so let's talk about binding. Um, so far, we have done some, bind, some one way binding of um, certain things in our scope are now bound to wherever we see these handlebar things. Um, but there's also the concept of two-way binding, where uh, you can basically say that certain fields on the page, certain text fields or, or other, sorts of, other sorts of items, uh, that whatever value is currently typed into the field is bound to your scope, whereas if you change the scope, then that change will, is bound to the text field and will, will be represented in that text field. So it's pretty powerful. You can basically just tell Angular at certain points throughout the lifecycle, hey, change this field, and all of a sudden that field will just immediately update. Um, but also, if you change stuff within the view, that is just type stuff into the text area as usual, your scope will automatically update with the new value. So that's pretty powerful stuff. How do we do that two-way binding to make it so this text area has a value of whatever we tell it to be? It looks like this. Ng model is going to be, uh, I'm going to say, I don't know, tweet text. I don't know. I'm going to actually say, let's say, uh, new tweet text. That's a better name. So ng model. Remember we talked about model view stuff? Well, essentially, by, by using ng model, we're saying that this view, this text area here, is bound to new tweet text within the model. And the model is, that we're talking about right now is the scope of the controller, main controller. So um, now that we've done that, I'm pretty sure that we can basically just go back into app.js and say content is scope.newtweet text. Uh, I uh, actually don't, I'm not, not, not to just yet. I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, there might be one or two things I'm missing. Let's see if I'm wrong. Yep, I'm wrong. <laughs> so something cool happened, though. I did press the tweet button, and a new tweet appeared on the page. Why is that? I mean, we didn't, we didn't tell the DOM to update whatsoever. We just simply added a new tweet to the beginning of this array, and Angular took care of the rest. Everything that happens within one of these things, like add tweet or whatever. Oh, and also, did we do it? Oh, no, it didn't say, it didn't do console.log. Oh, you know what? It can't do console.log, you did it, because for the same reason that we couldn't say var add tweet equals something. Console lives in the global scope. Console does not live on our main controller scope, so this code is not going to work. It's interesting. That's called an isolated scope situation where it doesn't have access to anything outside of it. So uh, yeah, anyway. So just add tweet is fine. We don't even need a semicolon. Uh, anyway, that doesn't explain why this doesn't work, though. Um, I wonder if I need to define it first as a string before I can make changes to it or have a or access to it. Let me try that. Let's just say scope.newtweet text is going to be an empty string to start out. I just want to double check if that if that actually works. Yes? Can you do an empty model in your closing tab? I don't know if that would affect it. That would totally 100% affect it. Thank you. Thanks. You uh, uh, did some good sanity checking there. Never put an attribute in a closing tag, ever. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so yeah, thanks. I just was not paying attention because I saw this text area close there and open the other place. So yes, sorry. Let's try that again. Ah, that was the problem. 
simple mistake on my part. Never put attributes in closing tags. It's simply not part of the HTML language. The end. Cool. OK, so that was easy then. Didn't need to even define it first. Just that, that binding seems to, seems to set the, the value to a string when I started typing into the field. Uh, initially, before it's anything, it's probably the value of undefined, meaning that it simply hasn't been set by anything. Um, Although maybe it's initially set as a string once the text area appears on the page. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, simply by doing ng model, we've got that two-way binding going on where typing into the text area sets within the scope and vice versa. Cool thing about that, because because like I said, it's a two-way binding, is that now that I have unshifted um, a new tweet onto the list of tweets, I can set the new tweet text content to Blank again. Ta da. So, you know, clearing the field is as simple as saying basically the value is now an empty string, and that's all. That's all I have to do. Coming from a jQuery world, Angular to me felt kind of refreshing because. I was writing a lot more plain JavaScript than I was writing a whole bunch of like chain jQuery statements like dot find, dot hide, dot add class, dot this, dot that. I mean, it's all JavaScript when it, at the end of the day, but this stuff looks a lot more like, like straightforward, just regular JavaScript than this sort of stuff where we're doing um, dot prop, dot on, dot closest, dot toggle class, dot, and sort of just living within that jQuery ecosystem. You could take a lot of this code and you know, just get rid of the idea of scope or whatever else, and then just like take this function, and it could be a function living anywhere, really. You know, but um, so that's one thing I kind of like about these libraries that sort of abstract the view away from the, the the actual data management that you're doing here. So yeah, there we go. We've got a working form. One thing that I that I'm not doing right now is uh, counting the amount of remaining characters, but that's actually very simple. See this tweet box counter here? It's just 140 minus new tweet text dot length. Cool. How's it going? Did you want to give me the, the head headphones? Yeah, no. come on, come on, come on up. So I'm going to forget about it otherwise. Thank you. I love this working here on Thursday. Thanks a lot for holding on to it. Cool. Uh, all right. Yep. So uh, again, Anything inside these, or actually I didn't even mention that. Anything inside these double brackets uh, doesn't have to be just be the name of a value. It, it, it can be a JavaScript expression. Just like this is a JavaScript expression, so is this. This just gets run immediately whenever, whenever it tries to render out this div. Um, and so it's just going to run do this math every time it needs to re-render that div. It's just going to say 140 minus new two text dot length. We're going to have a problem initially, though. Oh, no, we're not. I take it back. This actually answered my question of whether new tweet text becomes uh, new tweet text becomes a string or not. Um, if new tweet text dot length what or new tweet text is undefined and I try to get dot length on it, that would be an error and it wouldn't render anything out. But it seems that because I said ng model equals new tweet text, that immediately a string value gets set in my model and I have access to it right on the next line, so I'm able to subtract the length from that. But there we go. Simple as that. Now I have a working thing. In, in fact, it works better than it did when I did jQuery because I, I had to do that weird key up thing where entering in multiple characters didn't actually work until I keyed up on the thing. Now it's doing it a different way. Whatever whatever specific thing key press is causing the uh, is causing the actual data to show up on the field, that is exactly when um, the, the, the value gets changed and the calculation gets run, and different parts of the DOM update whenever they need to. Um, cool. Good stuff. All right, so we've got that counter. This whole thing, this little thing right here, replaces this entire um, calculate remaining characters thing. Well, actually, I'm, uh, sorry, I take that back. It, it replaces these two lines. But we do want to disable that input field whenever we are at 140 or whether we are at um, less than 0, right? So um, looks like I'm going to be using 140 a few more times. So I might as well set it in my scope so I have access to it. I'm just going to say 
scope dot character limit is 140 to pull it up. And now wherever I re reference 140, I can just replace it with the word character limit. All right, character limit, I'm just going to take that and do character limit. I'm also going to do right here um, ng-disabled, and then this is going to be a little expression that runs and determines whether the, this should be disabled or not. Uh, if it you know evaluates to true or evaluates to false. Basically, I can just copy and paste what I did up here. Remaining characters is less than zero. Remaining characters is equal to character limit. Although remaining characters, uh, I haven't specified. That's actually this character limit minus new tweet text dot length. So I could say I could paste this whole thing in here, like I'm doing now, or instead of that, I could make it the the uh, the result of running a function. Here's what I think. I think that the view should have as little logic as possible. Um, this is a little bit of logic. This is me actually subtracting new tweet text dot length from character limit. I think that's feasible, that's fine, it's just a single operation. But if you start having a really big Boolean statement, or you have a, like a, multiple lines of code inside an ng so-and-so, you might consider just making a function for it inside your scope and calling that function instead. It makes your view a lot more readable, or at least say a little more focused on presentation, where all of your behavior still lives within your scope. So let's just create a new, a new function called scope. Um, I don't know, form valid. And then we're going to return, we're going to say var remaining characters is scope.new tweet text minus, I'm sorry, yeah, scope.character limit minus scope.new tweet text. Then we return whether remaining characters is less than zero, or whether remaining characters is equal to scope dot character limit. So remember, we can by returning this whole thing, we're going to be returning a boolean, right? So because this is this is a boolean statement here is less than zero. This is a boolean statement here is equal to character limit, and this is a little boolean thing that that takes either one on, on, on the left or the right and turns it into true or false, right? Yeah. Yes, it should. Thank you. It should. Yeah. Because we are doing some subtraction of numbers from numbers here, we can't do subtract a number from a string. So yes, you are exactly right. Length of new tweet text. Cool. So now that we've got this form valid function, we can just do it right here. Form valid. So that little that little function is going to run form valid. The statement here is running form valid whenever it needs to determine whether this this will be disabled or not. Let's try it out. It didn't work. Cannot read property length of undefined. Aha. Aha. Okay. So there was a problem on line 71, app.js71, saying, cannot read property length of undefined. The reason for that is because, uh, well, ng model new tweet text was, was set right here. But chances are uh, it ran this ng disabled thing before new tweet text was actually like available within the scope. Maybe that would be like the next scope or something. So to solve this problem, I'm simply just going to say, Scope dot new tweet text is empty string, and now it will never be this never be undefined, and this function will have immediate access to it. That should probably solve the problem, I think. And there we go. Now it is disabled. Now it is enabled. Disabled again, and if I keep typing, then eventually it will be disabled again. Ta da! Cool. There we are. 
Any questions about this? Thoughts about how this works? As you can see, disabled simply, ng disabled simply takes uh, a statement which must evaluate to either true or false, and then it either disables or it does not disable it. Cool. So there's our nice working form. There's our ability to add new tweets. We might as well go ahead and uh, set up these retweet and like buttons. So here's some cool stuff. Um, remember that within this article, we have access to a, a value called tweet. We created it right here in, within this ng repeat clause. And what ng repeat does is it actually creates a child scope. It creates a child scope that exists throughout the page as long as the page is open. Um, and within this scope, it has, it has access to stuff outside of it, uh, like if I wanted to access form valid or new tweet text or uh, add tweet, I could. Um, but it only has access to the specific tweet that it's iterating through as long as this thing runs. So that having been said, um, we want to add some functionality to this retweet and like these retweet and like buttons. We want to make it so we can run a specific function that causes the current tweet to become favorite, I'm sorry, liked <laughs> or retweeted or whatever else. So first thing I'm going to do is just say ng click, that is the listener for click, of course, um, retweet, and I'm going to say tweet. ng click is going to be like tweet. So that's interesting. I seem to be passing in the tweet into a function called retweet or a function called like. So remember, throughout this article, I have access to tweet, and I can do whatever I want to it, which includes passing it into other functions. So the only thing is I have to create these functions, retweet and like. So let's go ahead and do it. Scope.retweet is going to be a function that can be passed in a tweet. Why do I know that? Because I'm doing it right here. I'm saying retweet, and I'm passing in the current tweet. And all I really have to do within scope.retweet is say tweet.retweeted is going to be true. Or if it's already retweeted, I want to unretweet it. So maybe I'll go ahead and say scope.retweeted is the opposite of, of tweet.retweeted. Sorry, not scope.retweeted. Tweet that retweeted is whatever tweet that retweeted is not. That is to say, if it isn't retweeted, then it will be, and vice versa. Yes. And then I can do the same thing with uh, like. Dot liked is not dot liked. Cool. So these functions, retweet and like, they'll work for every tweet on the page. Because I'm passing them in, I'm only changing the one that we're currently clicking the button for. Because remember, we're going to be click we're printing out these two buttons for every tweet that there is on the page, but they're all operating within a different, different scope. And that scope refers to the current tweet that's being iterated through. So you, can only, you have to take my word for it that it works, because I haven't added an ng class of retweeted or liked to the thing to be able to uh, do that. Give me a second, because I seem to remember something about how ng class works. I think that I can give it a list or something weird like that. Oh, yeah, I can give it an object. Cool. So ng class is expression. Now, the expression uh, is going to be either a string representing space delimited class names, an array, or a map, or an object, of class names to Boolean values. So specifically, what I can do is I'm going to add an ng class to this article. So I can add additional classes based on whether certain things are true or false. Just like I did with jQuery, I added class retweeted or class liked to article. But what I'm actually going to pass in to the ng class uh, directive is an object. And the object is going to be a series of true and false values. So it's going to look like this. Mm 
Let me just go ahead and put this on a different line so it's a little easier to see. So this is single single brackets because this is going to be a statement that returns uh, an object, and this object has two values in it, retweeted and liked. The values are uh, whether the current tweet has the value of retweeted or not, or whether it has a class of the, the thing of liked or not. If these are true, if either of these is true, then then those classes will be added on to this list of classes for this tweet. And if they're not, they just won't. So all you do is you just set a whole bunch of true false stuff and it'll either add retweeted and liked or not. So that's how ng class works. Ta-da, it works. As you can see, if I, if I inspect the HTML, you'll see that it adds a class of liked, adds a class of retweeted, or gets re removes it. It also adds a class of ng scope, which is just kind of for debugging purposes. What it's essentially telling me there is that um, whenever I iterate through this article, it's creating a new scope right there. It's basically saying this is a new part of the page. And if I wanted to somehow illustrate that some way, like if I wanted to, to draw a border or an outline around every new element on the page that generates a new scope in which, in which I can access new variables, then I could do that. You know, like it would look like this. Check it out. I just did ng scope is going to be outline one px solid red. So now there is a one pixel outline around everything on the page that has a new scope. This whole this whole thing, the whole the whole body has a class of ng scope because that's where I define the ng controller in which a new scope is created. And then each one of these tweets also has an outline, uh, or they have a, a class of ng scope because ng repeat creates a new scope in which I can use the tweet corresponding to this current tweet, right? So there you go. Um, that's just a nice little visual thing that I could do if I wanted to. Let's see. Um, man, we really blazed through, blazed through it, didn't we? Um, I have, I think I've pretty much just replicated all the behavior of all the code that we've written. So that means I can get rid of all of the jQuery. It's all gone. And there's actually less code than there was. All I've got is uh, a single controller, with, with which within its scope is the character limit, the list of tweets, which I'm just going to iterate through, the current text field value, um, a scope, uh, sorry, a, a function that allows me to see, see whether the form is valid or not, so I can disable the button. Um, a, a function that goes ahead and modifies our tweets uh, array up here and sets the new tweet text to something else. And then these two functions, with, which retweet and like the thing. So at the end of the day, these are very plain JavaScript functions that are just being added on to an object called scope. And I just have access to them within my HTML. Uh, by using ng whatever. Cool. Um, I have a few more things that I can talk about, but does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay. I feel like this class took like twice as long last time, which is why I, which is why I feel a little une uneasy because I feel like I'm blazing through stuff and not explaining it well enough or leaving people in the dust. So really, uh, if anyone wants me to go over anything more at this point, then I'm very happy to do so things that people might not understand. I think the thing that, that was hard, hardest for me to surmount was just the idea that within any of these, these, uh, within any of these quotation marks throughout the, the code, I had access to my JavaScript. So each one of these is actually a little JavaScript expression where I can just run stuff. Um, but that, all that said, the idea is that I'd like to make these expressions as succinct as possible, which is why I leave all the logic inside my JavaScript file, you know. Um, so in other words, instead of saying retweet, tweet, I could just actually write a series of different lines of JavaScript from here, but that would be a little icky, so I try not to do that. Um, I try to defer to an actual function that's in the scope instead. 
Okay. Um, next thing that I want to do is uh, take everything on this page and relegate it to a template. Um, that will prevent that weird behavior where when you first load the page, you might see that little weird flash of brackets and stuff on the page. We don't want that to happen. So uh, what I'm going to do is create a template for this entire page, and then I'm also going to create a template for each individual tweet, and we're going to see how that all gets used. Creating a template is as simple as adding a new script tag. And the script, interestingly enough, is not going to have a source attribute, but is going to have a type attribute of text slash ng template. That's obviously specific to Angular. And then it's also going to have an ID. And the ID is how I'm going to be able to refer to it uh, wherever I want to use it. And so I'm going to create an ID of index.html. Actually, no, I'm sorry, main.html. Let's call it that instead. That, that, that allows it to pretty much be there, the same thing as the controller, so main.html. And inside this script, I am seriously just going to take the entirety of the body from this form all the way down to the end of this section and cut and paste it right there. Maybe just do a little bit of indentation so I know what I'm doing here. Yep. Oops, this was not on the right page. Let's try it again. So my body is now pretty much empty. Nothing in my body, everything in this script, and that will indeed break the page. <laughs> so there is something that I need to do here. I need to do a simple ng include. Uh, sorry, so ng include allows me to include a template. Pretty much straightforward as that, and it looks like this. Actually, I forget what it looks like. One second. Ah, source. Source is going to be main.html. Now, this is interesting. This is the first case on the page in which I've used an element that is definitely not part of HTML. What I mean by element is that the actual name of the element is ng-include. In every other case, I used ng repeat, ng class, ng click, but these were all attributes rather than the actual name of the element. But in Angular, um, many directives, every one of these things is related to a directive, which is just a whole bunch of like behavior that you can apply to some part of your page. Uh, these directives can be represented as attributes, or they can also be represented as elements in some cases. So. In this case, I don't really need something like div or span or a section or whatever. I just need to I just need to have a single element that will pretty much just I think replace itself in, in most cases with the contents of main.html. Does it work? Nope. I did something wrong. Oops. What did I do wrong? I actually don't know. Hmm. Do I need something else? Source is string, source is string, string, argument, so-and-so, my partial template. Ah, this is stupid. Nope, that didn't work either. What did I do wrong this time? Cannot load main.html. Ah, it's actually trying to load a file instead of a template. How do I get it to load a template? Hmm, I actually forget. Reference. The what? The reference. Oh, the reference? It's a reference to a file, but I'm trying to give it a reference to main.html. So how do I give it a reference to that? Maybe just use hash in the form of the string. Hash? Well, this isn't a selector. Uh, this isn't like a CSS selector, so I can't use hash to refer to something else on the page. Uh, because it, because it has to be valid. Huh? You need to run this to the same file. Yes. Yeah, but that's that's not how you do it. Um, 
I'm actually literally going to Google this up because I forget. Uh, and uh, let's see, ng template include. Oh, well, sure, it's on this page somewhere. Oh, maybe it's ng bind template instead. Template URL. To load templates from other domains, uh, yeah, it actually is going to load an external HTML fragment. So that's probably not what I want. Let's try ng bind template instead. Debug template. No, that's not it either. One second. Mm, mm, mm. Aha. ID is tpl.html. ng click current tpl is tpl.html. Mm, mm. I get it. Okay. So, so I actually have to refer to something within the scope. Um, so what I'm going to do inside my scope is say current page is main.html. And uh, now instead of referring to main.html, wait, hold on a second. That shouldn't, that should, let me think about this a little bit more. That really shouldn't change anything, because I should just be able to refer to it by a, again, this is me being rusty with, with, with Angular. Yeah, that didn't work either. Try that again. Let's see here. X slash ng template. Did I, did, this, did I do this correctly? Current TPL is TPL HTML, TPL link, TPL content. Let's try a div instead of this ng include thing and see if it makes any difference. Nope, that didn't work either. Still trying to load it externally. But it seems to me like right here it should just do it. Am I doing this correctly? Text slash ng template. I could do slash main, but slash main.html, but it really shouldn't make any difference. Slash main.html. Current page. Trying to do that. Let's see here. Now, now it's trying to access main.html at the root of my file system, which is not any better. Hmm. That's strange. It does seem to differ from the uh, from what I'm used to. So I'm, I must be doing something wrong, but I forget what it is. No one has any any uh, suggestions from online, right? No. Inline stuff. Script type. Maybe it has to do. Maybe I can't put this up in my head. Does, would it make any cha any change if I did this inside the body instead? Probably not. Maybe it's a little file. Hmm. Maybe it's oh. File. Nope. It turned out that, uh, that, that, no, it was all about just not being in the head, and it must be in the body instead. Oh, that's, it was like outside the actual that's totally it. Uh, yeah, no, you're totally right. Um, this, this, the script, I couldn't, I couldn't have access to main.html because this was running outside the jurisdiction of ng-app, and so Angular had no idea what I was talking about. Um, so yes, you're totally right. Uh, if you're using a, a, a script with text, text slash ng template, uh, regardless of what the idea is. This idea can be Ruta Vegas. It doesn't matter. I can call this anything that I want, um, but it needs to be referred to right here. And uh, there we go. It still works. Now, um, let's just go back to main.html since that was silly. So why am I using double quotes and then single quotes here? Well, because uh, this source parameter is going to be evaluated like a JavaScript expression. Just like this, just like this, or actually that's not a JavaScript expression, sorry. Just like what's inside these brackets and everything. So whatever's inside here is going to be evaluated like an expression. And slash main dot HTML is not valid JavaScript. A string is, though. So if I, if I take this expression and put a string inside it using single quotes, then it's fine. Or I could just do what I did up here in app.js saying current page. And that is what routing is all about. Um, uh, I actually save this until the next, save this usually until the second week. In, in other words, I'm not really going to be talking about it uh, in depth. But 
um, there is the idea of Angular being able to uh, treat your single page app as if it has multiple routes. Uh, what, what there is is a little, little thing called ng-route, uh, or ng-router, whatever it is. Um, it, it looks at what's in your URL, and based on what your URL is, it loads up a different template. It also loads up a different controller. It essentially very tightly links your controller to a specific template that's loaded up. And uh, you know, if you, then you can click links that take you to a new page, quote unquote, but actually just change what the current, uh, the current controller is and what the current template is. Um, so that's actually, we're doing the very, the very basics of it right here. We've got this new variable called current page. And if we wanted to change it and show a different page, we totally could do that. OK, uh, another thing that I want to do is uh, just in case I wanted to have a, a separate page, just in case I wanted to uh, be able to show a single tweet, one of these single tweets on a different page, then I probably want to uh, remove it from within this big template for main.html. So what I'm going to do is create yet another script type text slash ng template and call it tweet html what I'm going to do is take this article here actually let me think about this hmm I think I actually just want to take the contents of the article nah I do want that whole article ah yes okay I think I know what I'm I'm going to do a div with uh, an ng include source is going to be tweet.html in remember double brackets because that's HTML and then single brackets because that's JavaScript. Sorry, double quotes and then single quotes because it's because it's JavaScript inside that HTML. Um, then uh, I'm also going to take this ng repeat, take it off the article and put it right here. Because the article template, the tweet template specifically, I don't want that template to repeat itself. Rather, I want to repeat the template. See the difference? Instead of, instead of telling the template itself to iterate through a series of tweets, that's not really a template for a single tweet. That's a template for tweets plural. So instead, I'm going to take that ng repeat outside of this whole article thing, and I'm going to cut it paste it up here, and unless I'm doing something horribly wrong, I think this should just work. So what I did again uh, was replace everything inside section with this ng include with the source of tweet.html, which is going to load up this script type text ng template with an ID of tweet.html. And I think that this should have access to tweet because I'm creating a new scope right here. So let me see if I'm correct about that. Yep, I'm correct about that. Yeah, so what's happening is that because this ng include div is what's responsible for creating a new scope, it's including all of this HTML inside it, and it has access to, everything, to, to this new scope that I created here where tweet is whatever it is. And should all just work the same, I think. Retweet, like, yep, ta-da, it works. Yeah. So you'll now notice, no matter how much I refresh, or no matter how slow I try to go, or fast I try to go, I will not see any of those brackets or anything. I will see a flash of blue, and that's the part at which simply the HTML or, the, or Angular hasn't started itself up yet. It hasn't initialized yet. So, you know, there are some cases maybe if you think that your, your JavaScript is going to be really, really big, you might want to put some loading spinner or something, a little, a little GIF that just shows a little rotating spinner before the actual page loads. You know, or you don't have to. It's up to you. You can do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, that's great. All we've really done is now created this separate little tweet here that we can do anything with. Um, you know, if we wanted to have a separate page that just loaded that up, and we're ready for that. Um, but honestly, I'm uh, tired of talking about it. Uh, so 
another thing that I should talk about, which which I which I also don't which I also don't have time to run through or describe or whatever. In addition to the whole react, in addition to the whole sorry Angular router uh, thing that allows me to, you know, load up multiple pages from a single page, is the idea of these directives and the fact that you can create your own directive. So a directive is a, a little bit of behavior that you can ascribe to any element on the page. And this behavior uh, has a whole lot of stuff going for it. This, a, a directive can run some code whenever you add simply the name of the directive to any element on the page. It can um, replace the element entirely with something new. So it can come with a template. It can sim simply be tied to a template uh, all of its own. So instead of creating this uh, text ng template here and then, and then using the ng include thing to include it on the page, I can simply add a, add, a, add a div or add a new element with the word tweet in it and create a directive called tweet, which would know to load up a specific template and just insert it in there. It can have a, a controller of its own, which is very similar to it having just its own scope, which will happen regardless. There's also the idea where a, a directive can set up binding. And we talked about this earlier, where this text area, for example, the fact that we've got this ng model thing means that we have some two-way binding between whatever's typed into the text area and whatever's available inside our scope of new tweet text. And so we can change it back and forth, and it just happens, right? Um, there's the ability, when you create your own directive, to set up two-way binding. You can pass in additional parameters uh, that might be coming from the scope outside, whatever you're creating. Um, you know, there's the idea of isolating a new scope and only using certain variables that you need. There's a whole bunch of stuff having to do with directives. But uh, thinking about creating new directives and using them and, and, and like, you know, becoming a master at them is where the difficulty curve spikes in Angular. Because the idea of, of creating your own directive with its own behavior, its own template, its own scope, its own binding, um, you know, all, all these other sorts of rules, um, requires the knowledge of something called the directive definition object, um, which just looks bad. Um, it looks like this. Ta-da, my module.directive, directive name, and then here's all the stuff that you could put into it. Priority, template, transclude, restrict, template name, scope, controller, controller as, bind to control, require, multi-element, compile, and then all that stuff. So, so it goes on forever, and me having to walk through what all this means is just significantly difficult. Um, I did, uh, you know, in previous series, I did talk about like the, 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 the basics of it, but I'm pretty much out of time at this point. So, um, but the idea is that you do have full control over more than just what all these different ng dash directives that come with Angular, but you can create your own with as much weird behavior as you want. Um, so that is where the magic of becoming an Angular expert, you know, like that's, that's, that's the, the, the draw of doing that whole sort of thing. Of course, we are talking about Angular 1, where in Angular 2, this entire paradigm is pretty much thrown out the window. Instead of the idea of directors, directives, there's the idea of components, which also, are all, which also have sort of been backported as an idea into Angular 1. So Angular 1 also has this concept of components as well, but I know nothing about them, so I really can't teach it. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Um, Angular 1 is still a pretty nice library. It, it, it makes sense uh, to a certain extent. It's, um, I'd say that it does mess up your HTML quite a lot and turns it into a whole big nest of weird brackets all over the place. But that's something that's not only specific to Angular. You'll probably you'll see that often in a lot of other template languages, including JSX with React uses. So uh, you know we'll and we'll be talking about that in the next two weeks. Um, yeah, but as you can see. Um, we've removed all of the data from this, and all that we have in return is a relatively empty body with nothing but script tags and a single div, and all of the actual data and behavior is pretty much defined here inside our uh, JavaScript file that we've written. So there we are. That's where we're at. Um, any other questions before I say we're all done for the day? Any other thoughts? Anyone online have any thoughts? No thoughts. That's fine. Cool. Um, neat. Well, then there we go. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing this yet again in a different language, and it's going to be React. Um, the first week is going to be on React, vanilla, just React. 
Um, but React itself is a pretty basic library, so we'll be talking about other things that kind of sit on top of that, um, such as uh, state management libraries like Redux, which we'll specifically be looking at. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, so cool, thanks. I do have an assignment in React in, in Angular. I'm pretty sure. I think, maybe. I forget. Oh yeah, actually, I have two of them. If you really do want to create your own directives, then you can do two assignments. This one will require some additional uh, study. If you are interested more in getting into Angular, um, I have taught that second class on Angular before. So if you want to, uh, if you want to see more on it, then um, I'm not going to waste my own time talking about it. But you can go to um, previous classes, click all the way down to class notes from previous series, and then within series nine, you can go over to directives, routing, and AJAX with AngularJS for June, I'm oh, sorry, I mean uh, April 11th, and uh, watch the video for that, the, the lecture videos right there. Yep, so that's where you can get more information. Cool. Um, we're all done. Uh, come to my lab on Thursday. I will be here to answer any of your questions. I'm going to be sitting in the Turing classroom right behind me. Uh, in this classroom, there's going to be like a, a programming for interviews thing. Or no, that, that's every other week, so that's not this week, but coming up next. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll also be sending out an assignment, so if you are not on the mailing list, then just go ahead and get on one of the mailing lists or a Facebook group or the meetup group. I uh, announce the, the, all of the lectures and labs and all of the assignments and all the stuff through every, every one of those venues. Um, finally, don't hit the noise bridge, because you, you wanna, you're going to want to do that. Uh, set up a recurring payment for 100 bucks every month, or 160 actually, do that, and uh, you're good. Great. Cool. All right. No problem. See you guys later. <laughs>